effective marriage counseling. If you want to, if, so what you would do actually, in my mind, if you, and actually the way that, if, if you see it in the, well, I think it's actually not this way. If you look at love maps as the bottom layer or even like the basement of the house, and then you actually, if you were to invert that list, it would make more sense because up here is shared, creating shared meaning. So the idea here is that when you're working with a couple, you're going to start here and work your way down. And, and the, the text also mentioned, I can't remember, I read another article because so I don't know which one it was, but if you can't make it through these three well, you're going to be frequently be in this negative sense of override. So the idea here is that you really can't keep moving through this until these three have been mastered or until the couple is doing quite well here. So that'll, that'll make a little bit more sense here in a second. Okay. So we're going to start with love maps. Do you want to get them up to iTunes? Do you guys want to get onto your iTunes? Do you want to, is there time for that? So I'll just describe it, um, and I guess we can go from there. So, so the idea here is that this is just a way for you to work with your couples in learning about each other. It's it's open. It's asking them or having them ask one another in session and out of session, open ended questions. This is very. Um, so it's it's they have a li I actually have a folder with a love map activity or intervention that I have used before with couples and the idea here is is I think it's like you can even treat it like a game there are one point questions two point questions and three point questions and you just give the couple the opportunity to go through and kind of like almost like I don't know like a newlywed game sort of thing where you ask them to read the questions and see if they know and understand what their preferences are as far as like a you know, like their favorite vacation or who my spouse's best friend is or how my spouse likes to spend his or her free time so things like that and the idea there is um, so to give you a quick example I was with a couple who I work with the woman frequently and just out of the blue randomly her husband will show up like every three or four or five months it's a little bit weird and so, and like he makes it very clear that he's like, he's not here for counseling and he's got nothing to share with me and I'm not a very safe person kind of thing. And I'm always like, okay, well, welcome to, <laughs> welcome to my session. And I'm like, I don't exactly know. So he's, he's not very open and I actually know quite a bit about him and I think he knows that too. So it's a little yeah. bit of a negative setup. Um, and so I don't feel, even if I sort of ask questions about him, I've, I've found because he's come two or three times um, the, he, I, he doesn't have enough of a relationship with me to where he, I, I'm safe and I understand that. And so instead what I've done before is I actually pulled this activity out and I said, well, why don't we just spend our hour giving you two an opportunity to get to know one another? And they loved it. They had a great time. They did a little love map activity and they asked each other questions or they filled out what they thought about each other and then they, we used that hour to dialogue about what they didn't know about each other. They've been married probably 25 years. And so that's kind of a good way to help them understand um, the psychological world of their partner, helping them become known and feeling known. It's just a good way to help, to, re to recognize really that in any marriage there's always something more to be learned um, about our spouse. I think sometimes we have a tendency to flatten those we love and just sort of make assumptions that we know everything there is to know about them or to make assumptions that if this is what I'm feeling then this is obviously what he is feeling or whatever. And so this is a great way to sort of expand that paradigm and um, help spouses recognize that there's a lot more complexity to um, to their partner than they sometimes recognize. Do you want to? Yeah. Play? Also, when you when you do this game, if you do do it, yeah. um, you want to make sure that everyone has the freedom not to know the answer, mm -hmm. because they can all be like, "What? You don't know that?" <laughs> <laughs> and then they can get into a fight, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so you need to say, "Hey, listen. If they don't know the answer, it's not something for you to get angry about. It's something for you to then share with them so they can remember." And so if it's like, you know, what's my favorite color? It's yellow. No, it's blue. You don't know it's blue? I wear blue all the time. Ooh. So you don't want that going on because then it backfires on you. So you got to warn them that they're supposed to be hospitable in this. And it's a, it's a real chance to discover one another in the area that you don't know. Um, and then if, and sometimes when there's an activity, if there's a question that comes up that they ask, like, what's my, what's my biggest unrealized dream? And the other partner's like, I don't know, tell me. And they start talking about it. They can end, end up spending a whole hour on it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they have to just keep going through the questions. Some of them are more difficult. And so a couple is just, it's, you can tell that they've been really distant for a long time. You tell them, don't go with the foolish right off the bat. Right? You just want to go with the simple ones, the ones and the twos. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones you want to start to discover about each other, these smaller numbers. And you work your way to threes and fours. Also, if they run out of questions, there's a game called the ungame. 
for couples mm-hmm. that they can order it through Amazon and get a ton That's more great. questions and games. So. Well, and that to, to that, I would say all we're looking for really, especially when you're in a situation like with my couple, is you're looking for a place for them to connect in a way that's comfortable and safe. And so, so really, if you can find a handle where they connect and they st- they start to like um, open up to one another, that would be a great time to just back away and not worry about the rest of the questions and just let them. Because a lot of times, I think this couple that I work with, they do spend a lot of time sort of like watching TV together. You know, like there isn't a lot of like. Yeah. Um, vibrant conversation going on in their marriage. And so you can see that like this opened up and expanded for one another. Like, wow, this person has more to say than I really have. You know, it's kind of like when you go to the restaurant and you look at the people across the way, not talking or on their phones or whatever. Like, you know, they've, they've, they've flattened one another and this is a way to help them see that there's more to each other than. That's a great point. And also it adds to the curiosity. So the right. more you know, the more you have to talk about. Right. And so like they don't have imagination to be curious. Yep. And so it helps give them the words to be curious. And so if you have them do some sacred time with each other, once a day they could use this little mapping exercise. Because yep. they feel intimidated to spend time alone because it's so quiet mm-hmm. and they don't know what to talk about. Yeah. And so this really helps stimulate some pretty good conversation for them. So it's just a nice it's a nice way to get them to feel more comfortable with each other. Kind of stir it up a little bit. And I will say too, a little bit off the subject, but the end game, or there's another version called Tell It Like It Is, I use that almost with every single adolescent I work with in the first and second session because they don't want to talk they just kind of stare at you they don't really want to be there and inevitably if I get them going on those conversations like we just start asking questions and I'll ask I'll ask one and then they both answer we'll go back and forth it works like a charm with every adolescent I work with it's really really fun so I think there's some apps too probably yeah mine's like a 1950s I don't even know where I got the thing but but some of my kids even say can we play that I want to play the card game again and then we just pause and if there's something that if they're going through divorce or they're going through anxiety or depression, it's neat that they may not have anything to say, but as soon as you hit a card, you can actually, you know, if you, you can wind your way to what you want to talk about through these cards. Like go through the back door and the kid doesn't even realize you're doing it. And next thing you know, you're having this like great discussion. Mm-hmm. They have done again for families. They have yeah. for, they have for lots of different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They have Tell it like it is. What was your question? You said like kids with autism. Oh, well, like, uh-huh. Strengthens communication. Yes. Skills. That's one of the kids I work with, has very, he's, he's a video game addict, and we'll sit there and all I'm doing, less important, I'm more less worried about the content than I am that he's looking in my eyes, that he's completing his sentences, that he's using his voice box. Right. Yeah. Where's the teen version? Six bucks at Walmart. Yeah, they're awesome. Teen version? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I also it's have a game, game and <laughs> where it gives you a printout, a lot of those same questions yeah. are on it, and not in no, but um, on Jenga. Yes, I've seen that. And that yeah. was really my, get, for my younger teens, kids. Yeah. yeah, my teens and younger kids both. I yeah. pulled some of them out that weren't appropriate for right. younger kids, but they both. Yeah, love well, that. that's interactive, and they're moving their body and their hands, yeah. and keep it. It it helps them from the anxiety of being in therapy or whatever. Right. Yeah. All right. Christian version of the game. Oh, there's yeah. There's, there's, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> Who's your favorite like five to one ratio? That's right. Yeah, no, very true. Okay, so beyond beyond the love maps, this this is okay. So the so I guess you could say if you're going like um, symbolically, like if you're going upstairs to the next layer of the house, you have um, helping a couple build fondness and admiration. And here, just the idea here is that um, we're trying to help the couples be scanning for what's going right in the marriage rather than what's going wrong in the marriage. And oftentimes, so if you remember back historically, early in the uh, history of couples therapy, people were only coming in in high distress, so it was hard to know what was working well because these therapists who were doing the research were never looking at healthy couples. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they noticed in all the research is that the couples that do well have this tendency to be looking for what the other is doing well. And they are looking and they intentionally try to recognize what the what the spouse is doing that is thoughtful or um just to you know it's funny i actually think in my <laughs> i've read a lot of gottman over the years um um especially before i got more into the emotion focus stuff and this stuck out to me and every time <laughs> if my husband does something that annoys me in my mind to this day i still think fondness and admiration 
Because <laughs> I do. I, I'm very fond of him and I admire him and I have to sometimes remind myself. <laughs> like, what do what does he do that I love about him? Even if whatever he's doing right this second is kind of driving me crazy. And it shifts my paradigm for him and I see him in a light that is more kind and loving. So the idea here is that we're trying to help our clients create a culture of appreciation instead of criticism contempt, defensiveness. I think that's what Gottman's always after. He's seeing those things that cause divorce and cause the breakdown of marriage, and he's trying to help couples be very, very intentional about undoing those things, and that's, so that's what this is all about. So we're trying to create um, affection and respect, um, and then helping couples be intentional about talking about it. My husband came from a family that um, was very intentional about being grateful. I remember the first time I went and visited his family in Houston when we were dating, and somebody thanked somebody for like taking the trash out. And in my family, that was something you just like, that was your job, you know? And I remember thinking, that's really weird. Like, and so, and so that was something that was instilled in him as a child is that you thank each other for small, even almost expected things. And, and he's always been that way. He was very, very intentional about that. So I've kind of definitely learned from him and picked up to be very, very grateful for like, oh, thanks for picking you know, our child up, even though that was the expectation, the plan. Um, but that's kind of goes along with sort of fostering this um, culture of appreciation at home. Um, and to do so verbally and physically, so not to just make any assumptions. Okay? No? Okay. Good. All right. Um, whoa. Okay, so we, we talked quite a bit about this, so I'll, I'll review this pretty quickly. I do, I will say, did Gottman, he didn't say much about, if you looked at the original, I'm trying to remember the gal's name who, whose theory this was, but you got turning towards, which we talked about, turning away, and then the other, the third one, which is turning against, which is actually sort of actively rejecting your partner. And I use, I do, I do talk quite a bit about this when I'm working with couples. This comes up quite frequently. Um, that that we are always sort of building like an emotional bank account and that the more often we are able to turn towards even on the small things um, the more you're building that trust up and then we start also it helps them to start be a little bit more deliberate about when they are turning away which feels to them neutral but to the partner it's not neutral at all right mm -hmm. and then turning against of course is like shunning or shaming or I'm busy or it's more it's more, um, it's like an active, it's, it's more than turning away, it's saying I'm too busy for you, I don't want to be near you, or I don't want, and of course that's even more corrosive. So I definitely make the distinction, especially with some of the, the couples that are in more distress and that are hurting each other more often. Um, yeah, so I think we pretty much went over that. So, okay, so just the bottom piece here is that couples who turn toward each other have better, have they, it's like, they're, again, they are, they, there's more of a culture in their home of love and appreciation, and so even when they're in conflict, they're able to defray it more quickly. They have more of a, a sort of a softness about them, and they're able to infuse humor even into conflict because they, they turn towards each other more often. Because there's more of a baseline sense of trust and that, like, I've got your back and we're on the same team. Yeah? All right. Okay, so... So uh, this is the fourth one, if you're going up, right? So we're on the fourth floor now. Um, and the idea here with, you, with sentiment override is, um, okay, so this one is the one where if you're not turning toward, if there isn't, if there isn't appreciation and, what is it? Appreciation and fondness. Um, and, if you, and if you don't know the psychological word of, world of your partner, you're going to be struggling with, I'm gonna start with, actually, is that negative? Okay, so if, that's, if, if those three things are not happening, then couples are going to be struggling with negative sentiment override. And if you, once you like have this language, it's very easy to see um, in couples. When they walk in and it's like something that, as I overhear like them recounting something that happened, um, from my perspective, it feels very, very neutral. Um, but from their perspective, it's like they have the chip on their shoulder. They see everything from this perspective of this guy or this, this woman is out to get me, right? Um, they become very hyper-vigilant about, about pretty much everything. And it's very kind of hard, again, when they're feeling that way and they're in their limbic brain, there's not a lot of talking them out of what they're experiencing, right? You can't convince them because they are, they're very, very activated around what they're feeling. Um, and they're feeling slighted, so they sort of see everything from like the Eeyore perspective, right? Like very, very negatively. Um, let's see here. 
Okay, so and, and uh, we we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but oftentimes this is because there are a lot of underwriting.